Today we're going to talk about ancient Celtic languages and our guest is David Stifter. Hello there, David. Hi, Frederick. You are a professor of Old Irish at Maynooth University in the Department of Early Irish and you've published widely on the field of Old and Middle Irish language and literature as well as on the continental Celtic languages. In other words, Professor Stifter is one of the leading experts in the field of Old Celtic languages. So I have a first question which seems basic at first, but I have a feeling that answering it will be somehow a challenge. What do we call Celtic languages and more specifically Old Celtic languages? How many were there and where were they spoken? As you said, I'm a linguist, so I'm looking at the whole question of the Celtic languages from a comparative linguistic point of view. A Celtic language is defined as Celtic in relationship to all other Indo-European languages. It is an Indo-European language that derives from the Proto-Indo-European language 6,000 years ago, whenever that was spoken by specific sound changes. So that's basically the simple definition of Celtic language. On the one hand, there's the modern Celtic languages that are still being spoken today, like Irish or Scots Gaelic, which are part of the so-called Gaelic branch, or the British Celtic languages, which is Breton or Welsh or Cornish. But that's not what we are interested in today. What we're interested in is the so-called old Celtic languages. And unlike the modern Celtic languages, they're not being spoken today anymore. So all we know about them is whatever has survived from them which unfortunately is uh, usually quite, quite little. How many were there? Well, that's a very difficult question to ask. Possibly there could have been dozens. I don't know. It's really hard to tell. If you look at maps of the extent of Celtic languages in antiquity, you will see that Celtic languages were spoken over most of continental Europe, certainly most of Western Europe, Central Europe, even going into the east of Europe, uh, southwest, uh, the Iberian Peninsula, and of course, uh, the islands. And the three areas that we know and uh, where we know that kind of separate languages were spoken are on the one hand, Lepontic, Gaulish, of course, and the Celtiberian language. And all of them are fairly geographically restricted areas. It's well possible that there were other Celtic languages. But when we speak about old Celtic languages today, we usually think about those three languages. So basically three old Celtic languages, Gaulish, Lepontic, and the Celtiberian language. We're going to define them soon enough. However, isn't there a fourth option? What about the so-called Tartessian language? Some scholars believe that some inscriptions that were found in the southwest of the Iberian Peninsula, well, those inscriptions are for those scholars Celtic. So wh what do you think about this theory, which is, eh, let's say, controversial? Well, that's putting it mildly. <laughs> as far as I know, there's only a single scholar who claims that they are Celtic. Everybody else, no. And I say, certainly say, no. Uh, we have no idea what they are, okay? We don't even know whether these inscriptions are in an Indian European language or not. Might be, might not be, we don't know. The so-called Celtic identification of the language is methodologically very questionable. It goes against basically all of the methodological principles that we usually use, so no. I don't include it in Celtic. So let's go back to those three old Celtic languages. Uh, how similar were they? What did they have in common? And how similar were they to other European languages? For me, as comparative linguists, the similarities between those languages are obvious, which does not mean that the speakers of those languages would have been able to communicate with each other. Probably not. The similarities for me lie in the fact that they use the same kind of endings, they use the same kind of uh, constructions, they use the same kind of noun or verb categories, they use the same kind or similar kinds of, of syntax, or if they don't use the same kind of syntax, you can see how one develops into the other. On a practical level, for the speakers of those languages, that, that would have made them basically unintelligible with each other. The same is true for similarities or dissimilarities with other European languages at the time. Again, compared with all the other European languages, those old Celtic languages look very, very similar. If I were to demonstrate it with concrete examples, you would immediately see what the similarities were with Latin, with Greek, and even going as far as Indic. So when and where uh, were those Celtic, old Celtic languages written down and, and by whom and possibly why? if this question even makes sense. As I told you, we have these three separate written languages, Levantic, Gaulish and Calabrian. They're completely isolated. It's not that the Lepontians and the Gauls interchanged with each other or influenced each other. The written traditions are completely separate. All we know about them is from archaeological finds. That's why we know when and where they were written. So the Lepontic language starts at the end of the 7th century or the early 6th century BC. That's archaeologically uh, dated, there's no doubt about that. And 
it's restricted to a very, very tiny area in the north of Italy, in the area of what we call the North Italian lakes. And then over the next couple of centuries, it kind of starts to, to spread a little bit. So first of all, it's simply the Lepontic language. It then gets taken over by Gauls who invade in the fourth or so century, and they spread along the river Po in the north of Italy. And the, the tradition kind of ends around the end of the first century BC or the beginning of the first century AD. So re really when the Roman Empire really kicks off. And if you think about it, it's actually about 600 years, so it's quite a long tradition. The Gaulish tradition starts around the year 200, maybe at the latest part of the first century BC. And again, it's originally confined to a very, very small region around the mouth of the river Rhone in the south of France and stays there for about 200 years. And then something very, very major happens. The Gaulish Wars by Julius Caesar. He basically meant a, a death to that writing tradition in the south, which used exclusively the Greek alphabet. But with the establishment of the Roman Empire over the rest of Gaul, Latin script became spread across the entire country and the Gauls took it up and used it for their own language. So when does it end? Maybe the third or fourth century AD. And finally, the uh, Celtiberian uh, tradition, a small area in the center of the Iberian Peninsula, at the, along the uh, valley of the of the Ebro and the, um, what is today the Meseta. And it is from about the middle of the second century BC until the end of the first century. So just about for 150 years, very short period. Okay, so that's the easy, that's the easy part. Uh, who wrote it? Well, that's everybody's guess, I guess. Uh, we don't know anything about the people uh, directly who wrote it. We can only make inferences uh, from what they wrote, on what objects they wrote, how they used the script. And the most interesting of those traditions is probably the Gaulish one, because it has the most diverse type of genres, diverse type of objects that were written on. And what we can see there is that the writing is used on objects that belong to everyday life. So everybody who's able to read and write could write the language. Speaking of which, of course, what, what did they use it for? Well, in most cases, unfortunately, rather boring for us. Many of them just left their names on, on objects. So it doesn't really tell us a lot. And why? Well, same reasons why we use writing. For instance, to put your name on, either to indicate that something belongs to you or that you made it, or with what I call social interactive type of writing. So this is a famous bowl from Banasak, which has this uh, wonderful Gaulish sword inscriptions, Netsamun uh, del Golinda, which means I contain the drinks of the next ones. It's a bowl which probably contains some kind of alcohol, which probably was passed around between a couple of people, probably men, and they were drinking together. So there's the social component to writing, obviously. Okay there, so um, what would be the most ancient inscription in a Celtic language? In other words, what would be the oldest proof of the existence of a Celtic language? Yeah, the, the oldest uh, inscription in a Celtic language, it's a little bit hard to answer, but we certainly know that it's a Lepontic inscription, and the earliest inscriptions that we have come from a very, very, very tiny region in the north of, of Italy, directly at the mouth of the Lago Maggiore. And there are a few from from the late 7th century. The problem is they're very, very hard to read and we're not even sure what exactly the, the letters are, so uh, I won't even quote them. The earliest that we're very certain about that is Celtic is one from the early 6th century from exactly the same region, from a place called Castelletto Ticino, very close to the town of the village of Colasecca. Colasecca is a town which gave its name to a whole archaeological culture. That inscription from Castelletto Ticino says something like Gossioiso. The oiso is very clear. That's the ending of a genitive. It means of somebody. The problem is the first part, how to read that. It's usually being uh, interpreted as of gostios, a name. So it's a cup, it's a small cup. Uh, a cup belonging to a person called, or to a man called Gostios. Okay, so, so if I understand, probably very short inscriptions, not full sentences, not full stories. Yeah, by far the majority of, of texts that we have are very, very short. Unfortunately, most of them are just names. Now, uh, it's not completely out of the question that we have longer texts as well, but anything that is more than 20 words is long for us. And, and some of them are actually full sentences. They are, of course, for us historical linguists, the most valuable ones because they give us more insight into how the language worked. Okay, so what are those longer inscriptions about then? Uh, well, again, it kind of depends on where you find them. For instance, in Celtiberian, we have a couple of those longer inscriptions, and these tend to be more of a kind of legal nature. So there's this one very famous inscription, Botavita 1, it's called, of more than 50 words, I think. Uh, uh, we don't understand all of it, 
That's the nature of working with languages like this. It's uh, some kind of legal regulation regarding the use of a religious precinct or something like that. Who's allowed to grow agricultural products there or cut down wood or something along those lines or use water or something along those lines. On the other hand, in the Gaulish uh, tradition, a good example are the so-called spindle worlds. These are small, rather heavy objects of stone or pottery. They have a kind of round shape with a hole in the middle of them. And what they're used for is for making wool. You put a stick through them and then you attach the wool and then you start spinning those things. And in that way, a yarn gets created. And from let's say the first century or the early second century AD from around the area of the modern town of Autun with a couple of them with inscriptions on them. The inscriptions are interesting for various reasons. First of all, because they're quite mixed in the language. Some of them are purely Latin, some of them are purely Gaulish, and some of them are a mix between the two. But what connects all of them is obviously spinning, and I hope nobody hates me for saying that, spinning is a typically female activity. Uh, what we can see from the inscriptions is that they were probably written by men for those women, and they sometimes have a rather erotic sub-meaning there. To take just a very harmless example, this is a very famous one which says, Nata Wintli Kurmida, and we can perfectly translate that, that's wonderful Gaulish, that means Beautiful girl, give me beer. So it just gives you this nice interaction between a woman and a man, or a young woman and a man. Okay, so yeah, basically about everyday life and social interactions. I've heard about other longer inscriptions that would shed light on their belief system or even their religion. We have a number of long inscriptions that are, well, we could call them magical. Okay, they have a magical function. They are curses or invocations of some sort. The inscription from Larzac, for instance, is about apparently two groups of women who curse each other, as far as we can understand. There's another inscription from Chamalier, uh, which contains a group of men. I would think that it is about a healing charm, so they ask for some kind of restitution of their health or along those lines. In all cases, it's difficult to be very concrete and very precise, because we can never understand 100% of them. So obviously those old Celtic languages were not written down in books nor even on paper. So where did we find them actually? And on what kind of material were they written down? If you ask me what I believe would be the most common type of material written on, I would say, well, Probably writing was used in those regions in the same way as it was used, for instance, in the Roman world or in the Greek world for everyday purposes, for instance, to write letters or, or things like that. Now, the problem uh, there is, of course, how did you write a letter? Let's look at the Latin tradition first. How did you write a letter in Rome? What you used for that is what you call a wax tablet. It's a small piece of wood, a flat tablet of wood, with a very fine coat of wax above it, and you can easily write on it. So you use a pointy, sharp instrument, a stylus, uh, and write on the wax. And I'm pretty sure that most of the writing in the ancient Celtic languages would have been done in that way. Big problem, of course, is nothing of that remains. It's well possible that they might have even used papyrus, which was the kind of equivalent to paper uh, that we have today. But again, nothing remains. We have very scant reports by Greek and Roman authors about this kind of usage. Okay, there's this one passage by the Greek author Posidonius from around 100 BC who visited southern Gaul and described what people were like and what their life was like. And he mentions that when people died, the relatives wrote little letters for them and threw them into the funeral pyre. Probably those letters were wax tablets. But of course, if it goes into a funeral pyre, obviously it burns and nothing remains. Or in Caesar's uh, account of the Gaulish War, he actually says quite explicitly in the sixth book that the Gauls use writing for all kinds of everyday business. So these kind of indirect evidence gives us uh, the impression that probably that's what it was usually written on. Unfortunately, as I said, nothing of that remains. All that remains are things that would survive in an archaeological context uh, over 2000 years, which is stone, pottery, actually most of the writing that we have is on pottery, and occasionally metal. For instance, in the Celtiberian tradition, they prefer bronze, specifically for those legal documents. The big advantage of bronze is that it is very resistant to any kind of uh, damage, so that's why it has survived so long. Iron, obviously, is not a very good idea because iron rusts, so that again disappears. In the Gaulish tradition, on the other hand, lead is quite uh, popular. The good thing about lead is that it's very soft, so it's, it's almost like wax, so you can easily write into that. I, I mentioned those curse tablets or those magic tablets, they are usually on lead, but from Gaul, from a place called Gauze, at the mouth of the River Loire, we have what seems to be a business receipt, simply uh, adding up numbers or 
payments or something like that, but clearly in the Gaulish language. So it's quite possible that that was actually a very common uh, way of using the language. All right. Uh, what alphabet did those old Celtic languages use or the people writing in those old Celtic languages use? Were those alphabets specifically designed for the Celtic languages or did people use existing alphabets at the time? There's one exception where a writing system was specifically devised for a Celtic language, but I'll come back to that in a minute. In all other cases, there's actually quite a diversity of writing systems used, about five or six different ones, but none of those other ones was originally for a Celtic language. I wouldn't even call it alphabet, I would call it writing systems. Uh, they used writing systems that their neighbors were using and took it over for their own language. The oldest one that we have is from the Lepontic tradition from the 6th or 7th century, and they took over writing from the Etruscans. And to be fair, it's always a bad idea to use a writing system of somebody else, because uh, that writing system is usually geared towards that other language. And that other language is obviously different from your own language. And we can see that very clearly in the case of Lepontic, the Etruscan language for which this writing was originally advised, for instance, made no distinction between voiced and voiceless consonants. So there's no distinction between b and p or d and t. So they only had a single sign for that. On the other hand, Lepontic, like any old Celtic language, made this distinction. But when they took over the writing system from the Etruscans, they only had a single sign to write either d or t or g and k, which for us makes the reading of these languages rather a challenge. So in Gaul, if we go to Gaul, uh, the oldest writing system is the Greek alphabet, which is fairly adequate for the language. But in both traditions, ultimately, this was replaced by the Latin uh, alphabet. The Caliburian situation is somewhat different. They took over the writing from their Iberian neighbors. And again, that language is very different from the Caliburian language. And the writing system is also quite different and quite different also from our own writing systems. It's, it's not an alphabet, it's what we call a semisyllabic script, which means that some of the signs in that script are alphabetic signs, a, e, e, or u, for instance, or l, l, m, n, but stops, for instance, could only be expressed as syllabic signs. So you could only write da, or de, or di, or do, or du, and each of those five had a different letter, which is not ideal for the Celtiberian language, because, for instance, you couldn't write, for instance, uh, your name Frederick, okay, so he starts with fr. Uh, you couldn't write fr in that writing system, because after the F, you, oh, well, uh, you didn't have an F in the first place, but, <laughs> so that was another problem. They didn't have letters for all the sounds. For instance, in this case, they would uh, substitute by a B or a B letter, okay? But you couldn't write fr, but you had to write bere, and you had to know that you didn't sound the first E. So it makes it very, very difficult, all right? But again, in the case of Celtiberian, again, the Latin script took over. The only writing system that was specifically invented for a Celtic language, it's a language that we haven't actually talked about yet, that's uh, the Orem script for the earliest stage of the Irish language, which I also count as an ancient Celtic language.